Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Last Life Ever podcast. I am one of the hosts of this program, Jillian Sidoti. And to one side or the other is Jeffrey Holst. <laughs> I do it wrong every time. I point to Jeff the wrong way every time. Today, we have a very special guest. Uh, I'm very super excited about talking to her. Jeff, who are we speaking to today? Uh, we are speaking to two-time Olympic gold medalist in bobsleigh. I think that's what they call it over there in the Canadian <laughs> parts of the world. And um, and anyway, her name is Heather Moyes, and she is amazing. She has a book, and she's an Olympian and did a whole bunch of really cool stuff. So I'm super excited to speak to her. So rather than ramble about how awesome she is, let's just bring her on. What do you think? Help me, my brother, can you lend me a hand As I walk through this land of confusion If we give to each other, then there's nothing to take Let's live life for the moment before it slips away Heather, welcome to the show. Hi, everybody. <laughs> well, we're super excited to have you here. Jillian's been uh, ranting and raving all day about how much she loves you. So, <laughs> I think it's awesome to have a uh, you know, yeah, it's a, our first Olympian on the yeah. program is 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 yeah. enough. But then on top of it, you know, Heather has a whole journey that she talks about because you didn't start off as like a hardcore athlete, right, Heather? No, no. I grew up in a pretty small town and played, I did play sports my whole life, but just for fun, I, it was always, um, I, it was always something extracurricular to what I, I thought I was always going to do to earn a living. So mm -hmm. to me, I grew up in an academic family, just focused on getting a master's degree in occupational therapy. And to me, when you don't have Olympians growing up around you, uh, those Olympians are, they, they're just TV people. You know, those are TV people, not everyday normal people like I considered myself to be. So it's not like I ever kind of consciously thought, no, I can't do that. It's just that it never occurred to me as being an option or a path. You know, mm -hmm. you kind of make your paths and your choices based on what you see in front of you and what's around you and and that sort of thing. And so, yeah, I didn't actually start training or like lifting weights or taking sports seriously until I was 27. Holy moly. Wow, that's yeah. crazy. <laughs> that is um, crazy. Yeah, so so that's that's really interesting actually. I um I didn't even realize that part of your story and and Jillian's <laughs> apparently uh better informed than me. So that's cool. <laughs> but uh anyway, no, that's um so you grew up in a small town in Canada, right? Somewhere. Mm -hmm. So what's what's in what what part of Canada? Yeah, I'm from Summerside is the name of the town now sort of technically a city, but still only about 15,000 people okay. um, in <laughs> Prince Edward Island, which is the smallest uh, province in Canada yeah. off the East coast, you know, just oh, I, I, ha I have to ask you. So the yeah. bridge to Prince Edward Island, is it yeah. still, uh, is it still like $50 to cross? Yes. Yeah. It's crazy. Like yeah. I drove out there once when I was on a whim, like I grew up in Michigan and I was like, Oh, I think I'll drive to Montreal, which is nowhere near Prince Edward Island, no. obviously. No, not really. And I got to Montreal and I was like, man, everyone speaks French here. I don't speak French. <laughs> I'll just make a right turn. And I drove to Prince Edward Island, like oh literally like all in one trip with my friend, Jason. Who's That's a, a good road trip though. Show. That's a pretty solid road trip. Yeah, it was a coast? lot. Yeah. I mean, most people wouldn't start in Montreal. They would like go to Halifax, like go to Nova yeah. Scotia, do New, New, New Brunswick, yes. Nova Scotia, PEI. But it is, it's pretty awesome yeah. out there. But the thing is that with PEI, you, you don't have to pay to get over the bridge. You just have to pay to leave. <laughs> Yeah, is it the? Are you sure it's not the other way? Like yeah, when I sure. went, it was definitely the other way. When I went, it was well, paying to get on, the, on the island. No, I was paying to get on the island. I'm positive of that. But this no, was like a long one, time. There's only one payment, but that's why it's so expensive because you don't. Have, you only have to pay one direction. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's fascinating yeah. though. Yeah, I didn't uh I didn't expect it to be quite that it was and it was weird too. It wasn't like we were gonna trap you there. We just wanted it was, to, you know, we try to keep people. So we you gotta yeah. pay to leave, you can't afford it, you're gonna stay with us. So that's fascinating. Yeah, it yeah. was <laughs> and it was a weird number too. I think it was forty dollars and fifty cents. Like it wasn't well, it like up, right yeah. every uh, every few years or every something like that, it goes up a certain percentage. So oh, it's like, that, that explains why like it was I think weird. it's forty nine something random right now. Yeah. Well, so well of- Jeff, I find it absolutely fascinating that about, you know, 20 years ago, you spent $50 <laughs> yeah. to cross a bridge, yeah. but I'm going to get back to Heather now. Yeah, fair fair enough. That's okay. Fair enough. It was probably like 15 years ago though. Just to be fair. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> So, so you weren't, you were athletic in high school. I read that you were athletic in high school, but you were, it was more of an extracurricular activity and, and, and you really were focused on academics. So how did you make that transition and what made you go, Oh, I'm going to make this transition. I, I, I've decided I'm going to be a serious athlete now. Yeah. I don't think that thought crossed my mind. Like, Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm going to, pursue being a serious athlete, it was actually, um, so in my undergrad, during my undergrad of university, uh, I played three different varsity sports and still never lifted weights. I just kind of played for fun, just mm-hmm. did whatever was required at the training sessions. That's and a then, lot of varsity sports in Yeah, college. they were kind of seasonal. So I played, okay. I did track and field, like as a mm-hmm. sprinter for all four years of, of university. And then I did soccer for my first two years in the fall. Okay. And then I was invited to play in a rugby tournament in the summer between <laughs> second and third year. And I hadn't played since high school. So I was like, oh, I don't know, but okay, I'll go. Cause you're short bodies. So I went and played in this tournament for this team. And I was like, Oh my God, I miss this so much. I'm not going back to soccer. So I played um, rugby for my last two years. So it was, <clears throat> it was really great, but still it was just for fun. At the end of um, university, uh, I got apparently long listed for the national, like a, a development camp for the national team. Wow. And when they said, Oh, congratulations, you've been long listed. I said, long listed for what? Well, long listed for the national women's rugby team. And I was just like, we have a, we have a national women's rugby team. Like <laughs> I didn't even know at the time that we did. So it's just, it's something that I love to share with people is that as successful as I was, especially in rugby, which I love so much. And it's um, vicious by the way. I got, vicious, it's, vicious not vicious, it's just very physical. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've been corrected. I'm sorry. But, uh, yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but it is um, like, I got that far just doing something purely because I enjoyed doing it. Not because I was trying to reach another level. So part of that is with some people, they get stress on the brain and everything because they're trying so hard to reach another level and they forget just because they're doing something because they purely love to do it. So that's when I made kind of the under 23 team. So they had a development team that year, first year they ever had a development team. And then I left, but see, I didn't think of sports again as something you just stay in. I was like, okay, well, I'll play if I happen to be here. So I went and lived in Ireland for half a year and worked over there. Then I got an internship to work in Trinidad. Um, and I'd always wanted to work in a developing country. So I was like, I'm super excited. I get to work as a di- disability sports program officer, like really excited. And just before I was about to leave, I got a random call from a track coach at a different university saying that he was asked to do recruiting in Eastern Canada for bobsledding. And I was like, bobsledding? Like who on earth does bobsledding? And <laughs> And he was just like, I know who's in the program. You'd be, you know, and I said, no, I'm not going to do bobsledding. I'm I'm going down to Trinidad to do an internship. And he goes, Heather, I know who's in the program. The Olympics are less than a year away. You'd be going for like, I know who's there. You'd be going to the Olympics for sure. And I was like, no, I'm, I'm okay. And he's like, Heather. And you could tell by that reaction that going to the Olympics had always been a dream of his but it hadn't been a dream of mine. Like I didn't grow up dreaming to go to the Olympics. So for me, I was pursuing what I felt was important to me and what was, what was truly, you know, my goal and my passion at the time to do work in a developing country. So I was fine, left, went to Trinidad, lived there for almost three years, doing a few different, you know, contracts. And when I came back to Canada to do my master's degree, I did one year of this two year program and I happened to run into the same guy at my former track coach's retirement party. And he was just, I think you should still do this. I know you're older now and it would be a lot harder. And I was like, oh, hell to the no. But anyway, so he was just saying like, just constantly, constantly, constantly. And I finally just said, okay, I'll just do the testing. 
just give me the information. I'll go to the testing camp. I'm in the middle of my master's part. It's not like I'm really going to do this, but I'll just do this just to get you, you know, off my back. <laughs> so I went to this testing camp and I ended up breaking one of their testing records. And I was like, wait a second. You mean to tell me that I have broken a record amongst all these athletes who've been training for years and who are supposed to be representing us at the next Olympics, which are less than five months away. And so for me, it suddenly turned into this challenge. Can I learn a new sport? Can I learn to do it well? And can I learn to do it well in time to represent my country in less than five months time? It, it didn't work out very well, right? Like It's not like you guys are the Jamaican bobsled team. You guys are in Canada. I would think people know how to- uh... Run on ice? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it if, would seem like it. Would seem like it. <laughs> I yeah, mean, it would seem like it. Yeah. It was weird though because it was like this. Ch like I didn't fall in love with bobsledding. You know, it, mm -hmm. I didn't. I hadn't even seen a sled or been down the track yet. But I had to make a decision as: Am I going to put my master's degree on hold for you know a year mm -hmm. just to try this random challenge? And it was the challenge that I fell in love with. And so that's kind of, I thought it was just five months out of my life. Okay. What's the big deal? Five months. Let's see what can happen. Let's see how close we can get. And so I challenged myself and we ended up coming fourth. We missed standing on the Olympic podium by five hundredths of a second mm -hmm. after 5.7 kilometers. So it'd be 3.54 miles mm -hmm. after that accumulation of four heats down, that's 3.54 miles. And I missed we missed it by five hundredths of a second. So I went back, finished my master's degree, but that was haunting. That was like unfinished business. You know, the next Olympics were going to be on home soil. I started thinking, well, if I did that in five months, what are the chances about if I trained for three years leading up to Vancouver, could I actually win a medal? Like not only stand on a podium, but like actually could I win a medal for my country? And so it just became another challenge. Like, can I do this? Like, and so that it just every Olympic game. So I've been competed now in four Olympic games and all four of them have presented me with four very different challenges. And so it's just the challenges that I kind of fell in love with, not just the winning for the sake of winning, but the challenges themselves. So, so wow. Yeah. So, so you, you obviously did go back to the Olympics. We know that because we sort of prefaced this with you had yeah. two, <laughs> two Olympic gold medals. Um, that's <clears throat> pretty remarkable. Uh, I'm wondering though, like at, at what point did you go like, okay, I, I, you must have loved the sport, right? Like you must have just kept doing it because you won a gold medal. You didn't have to do it again, right? I, I didn't have to do it again. No. Um, do you mean after Vancouver? Well, like, any of, yeah, I guess that's part of it. But like the other thing is too, you do realize that this isn't normal, right? Like it's not normal to just be like, Hey, I'm going to go try out for the Olympics. But why isn't it normal? I don't know, but like it isn't, right? So like how do you like if, how do you if, explain that? Like how, if how more did you... people just said, I want to see and test myself and see how close I can get, as opposed to having this fear of just failure, like it being a success or failure, like totally just two options. You're either gonna succeed or you're gonna fail. Instead of approaching, and I'm talking about any goal. If you're if people just embrace their goals by saying, yeah, okay, maybe it's unlikely, sure, but I sure as hell want to see how close I can get. Like, that's like just when the Jillian, challenge of seeing how close yeah. you can get, that's when you discover what you're really capable of. Yeah, that's like when Jillian tried out for the voice that one time. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> I can't wait to hear about this. No. Well, yeah, you should. Jillian, tell her about the time you tried out for the voice. I, I want to hear this. Story. I haven't tried out for the voice. I'm supposed to try out for the voice. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Like, I know, I, I no one, I should not try out for the voice right now. <laughs> but no, I, it, a year ago, I told Jeff that I would practice and try out for the voice, and I have not done it. Yeah. So. it actually, give what, us a it, little rendition right now. Yeah. No, oh, I will not. <laughs> I've, heard, I've heard her sing before. No, there do was remember, no thought there whatsoever. Do you, do you remember the words to the Chattanooga Choo Choo? I'd like to hear that again, actually. Okay, so the way Jeff and I met <laughs> is we met at an event, like we told you before, off air, we were, we're, we're both lawyers, and I was speaking at an event as a lawyer on the area of law that I specialized in, and Jeff came up to me later and started talking to me, and I said, oh, I'm familiar with your podcast. He has a real estate podcast, and I said, it's, you know, 
this pad, he goes, you don't know my podcast. There's only 70 people who follow my podcast. And I said, well, and I'm one of them. It was, in fairness, <laughs> in, in fairness, it was more like 17 people. It wasn't 70. We had only had like three episodes at this point. Like, But I knew, for whatever show. reason, I knew about his podcast. And uh, so he's talking to me and I said, you know what? I think I'm going to come on your podcast. And he said, we don't have guests. We just, it's just me and my friend. And we sit around yeah. drinking and talking yeah. about it's real a, it's estate. It's a drinking show. It's called Old Fashioned real estate we drink old fashions and talk okay, about real yeah. estate investing yeah. yeah so she's like yeah no i'm gonna be on your show and the short version is i was like no and then i was like okay but you have to come to chattanooga if you want to be on the show she lives in southern california so it's not you know it's not next door and she's like yeah i'll do that and so we yes met. and then she so came on the nashville. show yeah, yeah we met in oh, nashville so and she sang the chattanooga choo choo i sing the chattanooga choo choo <laughs> That was, that, is, that was is that your audition song for the voice? I don't think I'm going to use that one as my audition yeah. song, although I haven't tried at all. At yeah. all. Yeah. <laughs> so, so in fairness, when the coronavirus shutdown happened, so like last year, and this is a good transition to something you did, so we can talk about this. But last year, um, it was like a year and a half ago that we had we first met, and then. Um, I told her about my idea for Last Life Ever, and she was like, oh, I want to do that with you. That'll be really fun and, you know, be great. And I was like, okay, cool. But I we have to wait until I get back from Africa because I was going to go to Africa and climb Kilimanjaro mm -hmm. in February of last year. So a year ago now, I was in it was in Africa. And, um, and I did. I came back from that, and we planned to start March 16th which was the day of the first day of the global shutdown pretty much yeah. like literally March 16th. So, so that day we had like a, um, this is really weird show. Like we don't know what to do. Like, <laughs> like should we do the show or not do the show? We ended up doing it cause we had a guest planned and you know, it was an online thing anyway. So it didn't really matter that we were all stuck in our house. Um, but uh, that day is when Jillian decided that because we had this two weeks, two weeks, right. A two week shutdown, that was that was what we were told. 15, 15 days to slow the spread is what they said here. And so we were like, okay, 15 days. She's like, I think I'm gonna work on singing for the next 15 days. And then later I'm gonna try out for the voice. I think I did everything but worked on singing. <laughs> yeah. And then we proceeded to get drunk every day instead yeah. of actually doing anything productive. But so so circling back on the Kilimanjaro thing, this is actually one of the things I want to talk to you about. One of the and I know we we didn't finish the Vancouver thing, but I'm jumping around a little, so I apologize. You actually That's told fine. me when we first met that you climbed the highest mountain in Antarctica. That's to me, that sounds a lot harder than the high, hardest mountain in Africa. So how did that happen? Yeah, so I had uh, a random phone call came out of the blue from a man I had met at uh, like a fundraiser, like kind of a private fundraiser golf tournament slash dinner um, about a year before. And he called and he says, I'm not sure if you remember who I am. My name is so-and-so. We were talking about this, yada, yada. I had, I, I had no idea. I didn't remember him at all. So I'm Googling him while he's talking to me. Um, and he basically just said that he has, he and his family are huge supporters of Rugby Canada. They love rugby, but they're also huge supporters of the, our Canadian military. So um, he said that he's going on this fundraiser, this climb in Antarctica, um, and it's a fundraiser to help raise awareness for post-traumatic stress in now called injury instead of disorder, mm -hmm. but post-traumatic stress disorder. And um, also to raise money to help our Canadian Armed Forces, the members of our mm -hmm. Canadian Armed Forces transition back to civilian life once they're finished, you know, nice. serving. So yeah. uh, he basically, I am thinking my head during this conversation, all it was, my head was in a space where I'm like, okay, he's just gonna ask for a donation. Like some signed Olympic memorabilia, like a signed shirt or jacket or something. He's gonna auction it off for money, or like for fundraiser. So I'm just waiting for this. And he just said, and I'd like to sponsor you to climb the mountain. And I was like, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, what? And he's like, yes, I think that by you doing it, it would raise a lot of profile. Now it's cost $50,000 and you have to raise an additional $50,000. And I'm like, uh, 50, 000, I'm a Bob. You realize I'm a bobsledder, right? Like it's uh, like, I'm not NHL. I'm not a Serena Williams tennis player, like bobsledding. Uh, yeah. So, so he said, no, 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 no. I want to sponsor you in doing this. And I was like, okay. He said, now 
if you need to think about it, I understand. And I said, well, I have a business. Like I speak for a living. You're talking about something that is a year away. Um, it is like a week commitment in the summer. And then you're saying another three weeks commitment in January to climb, to go and climb the mountain. So I'm just like, I have to like, it's not like I have a salary, like a, a salary that I know I'm getting every year and could just take some vacation time. It's like, you know, all your income could happen in a week for the entire month or two months. You know, you just don't know. It's all, it's all flexible. That's what it is to be self-employed. So I basically just said, I need to think about it. And I get back to him in a few days. And then as soon as I hung up the phone, I was so embarrassed and, <laughs> and angry with myself for the fact that it took me, that I couldn't say yes right away or that I didn't, that I hadn't said yes right away because the only reason I am able to live the life I choose to live is because those servicemen and women chose to put their lives on the line for me to do so. And I'm like, the least I can do is go and climb a freaking mountain. So I was like, I called my back and I said, I'm sorry it even took, I, I'm in. And then my head started going like, okay, I hate walk. I'm a sprinter. I hate walking. Okay. The whole thing is mostly walking, like incline walking, but I hate walking. I'm not an endurance person whatsoever. And I hate the cold. Like I, I know I'm Canadian. I know I do a winter sport. That's why I go so fast is to get out of the cold, right? Like I just, I'm good at what I do because I do not like being in the cold. So I am just like, there's nothing really about this whole excursion that is exciting to me whatsoever. Um, but I also just decided to embrace it because without embracing, like stepping outside of your comfort zone, we hear these kind of terms all the time, but without doing the stuff, then you're, you're often not, you can't make magic if you just stay comfortable all the time. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a challenge that I took on because I believed in the cause or because some, this gentleman, because he believed so much in this cause, then I felt like I could make a difference and do something about it. So yeah, that's, so a, that's, a, that's amazing. Uh, it's really, I mean, I think there is something really wise about what you're saying, which is like, you know, sometimes you just have to do the things that you have to do, right? Like you just, you have to be willing to take risk. And that's really what you're talking about. I mean, actually everything that you're talking about is about taking risk. Like the idea of like, going and trying out you kind of minimize it and you're like oh i just figured i'd go you know t do the testing or whatever but but most people would never do that they're presented with these opportunities and they just say no and they hang up the phone and they never call the guy back it's because it's because people are feared of failure and it's, the problem with that is that it's not actually failure that people fear it's what we assume failure will bring so it's often we, like when I'm when I'm speaking or when I'm working with people, the things that hold us back mostly are assumptions, self-limiting beliefs and fears. But the fears themselves, we're not actually afraid of failing because if we celebrated failure, then you'd be all for it. But what we're actually afraid of is what we assume failure would bring, which is things like ridicule or isolation or, you know, um, judgment, like being judged by somebody else for not like that's what yeah. we don't. That's what we're trying to avoid. So. <sighs> I think yes. that that's uh, if we kind of embrace that and and that's the thing climbing that mountain was one of the most rewarding things I have ever done and part of it was like it wasn't so much because of the physical excursion like the physical challenge of it which was sometimes excruciatingly cold and and really hard and exhausting on the body and all of that stuff but part of it was because of the relationships I made on that like there were probably 16 civilians like civilian people on the trip and there were about eight uh eight servicemen or women like soldiers who kind of came on that trip with us and then we had about six or seven guides like a medic a photographer and some guides and stuff but i mean those some of those people have become like a family like a second family mm -hmm. to me and it's been really really incredible and you know i'd take minus 50 degree weather <laughs> any day if I could have a family like that. No, that's, that's um, yeah, that's, that is really great. I mean, and I, I, I'm, I will agree with you, like the, the relationships I made in, in Tanzania, like climbing, like there's something you're going through something unique with other people. It makes a difference. Yeah. You find, you form a different kind of bond than what you would if you're just like, you know, hang out with them at a coffee shop or something that's like true. that. When you have a joint goal, when you have a goal with somebody else, and you go through difficult times in order to get there, it's it's pretty bonding 
for sure. Yeah. That, you must feel that way, like with your teammates from 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 rugby, from from the Olympics, things like that as well, right? I mean, yeah, it's sometimes the same kind of thing. because I, because I've shuffled back and forth between sports so much, the teams also change, kind of and evolve and change in between, and so it becomes it's it's a little bit different. It's almost like they're short term, really short term relationships, and you bond so quickly and so well in the moment. Um, and there are probably, I would say maybe a handful out of my whole life, there are probably just three or four, uh, with whom I still really keep in touch. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's different. It, like even within these bonds of common goals, you still kind of connect with one or two people. So I want to, because, because we're actually like in danger of running out of time and I apologize no way! for that. Oh, yeah, God. I know it's so fast. We'll this have you on so again. What, what I know, I know. You, well, you know, you actually, like sometimes we run long, but like I, we took this poll in the Facebook group and I started a <laughs> class and the class starts in like 15 minutes. So like I have to go, <laughs> like you guys can stick around if you no, want. But but, like, I, I, I get the no. last question. Well, I get no, the wait, last I, question. You get the last question, but I have one more thing I want to ask before that. Okay. And that is, um, I want to talk just for a minute about your book because we were talking about this off the air and people can buy, I think, even personalized on your website, right? Yeah. Which your website is um, is just your name, right? It's just Heather just Heathermoist.com. Yeah, yeah. Heathermoist.com. And um, and and you, I read the beginning of your book. I, like I said off the air, I didn't get a chance to read the whole thing yet, but um, fascinating stuff. And it's really what we're talking about in a way. What what we're saying is, you know, let's let's look at the world in a different way. And let's, let's dream those big dreams. Like you start out in the introduction talking about, you know, when you're a child and you believe you can be an astronaut or whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so, so let's talk about the book for a second. Like, when did you write it? Like, like how, you know, how is that process? And, and if, and what, what's the key takeaway from the book? Yeah. So I was, um, I don't know if you were familiar with John Maxwell or not. Mm -hmm. Um, and Absolutely. So he's, yeah. People yeah. Don't know, he's a big leadership guru down the yeah, state. Yeah, I saw he wrote the intro to your book, actually. He wrote which the forward, awesome. yeah. yeah. Now, <laughs> see, this is the funny thing is that I was hired to open, like, I was hired to kind of open for him for a three part event um, when he was coming to speak in Canada. And to be honest, I didn't know who he was at the time. I just was told, I, like, I'd never shared the stage with someone like that before, where I was kind of speaking before him at all these three different events. And and so I just was like, okay, well, give me some information, some background. Like, I don't need to know kind of, I just need a general sense of what his messaging is. So they said, oh, well, he's an author. So I just looked up John Maxwell author. And he's got like 80 books on leadership or something. Right. So I'm like, okay, he's a, you know, okay, great. He's an author. So I kind of flip through some of the titles and like get a little gist of kind of his approach and what he talks about just so that, you know, we'd be compatible. And, and it was awesome day. And as soon as it was done, he came over to me and he said, <clears throat> Heather, I've got to say, like, I hear a lot of speakers, but very rarely do I hear a speaker who connects as well to very different audiences as you do. I'd like to mentor you. And I was like, oh, well, that's nice. Like, I still didn't know who he was. So I'm like, oh, that's wow. Nice. Yeah. Thank you. So, so they, just to be clear for people <laughs> who don't know who John Maxwell is, they actually teach his work. Like when I got my master's in business, they were teaching his books. It's, it's wow. Like, yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So I figured this out very quickly. <laughs> yeah. He gave me his phone number, his cell phone number. And I was like, okay, well, the next day I said, oh, well, I'll just send him a message and say, you know, I hope he's traveled home safely, you know, back down to the States. And it's really great to meet him and his pilot. Um, so then it was kind of a, I don't really, I've never been mentored before. What does that mean? You'd live down there. I live here. How would that work? And he just said, well, you can call me if you have any questions or if you want to bounce any ideas off or, you know, I'm doing a workshop. He goes, actually, I'm doing a workshop. I would love like hosting this conference. I would love if you could fly down and meet my staff. And I was like, oh my God, you have like you have a staff? What? Okay, you're not. Uh, what speakers have staff? I just was like, okay. Right. So I signed up for this thing just to go down there, and I he sat me with his niece who was over from Colorado, and so we kind of went through this program. But like, there were 1,300 people there, all re like revering the, and I'm like, yeah, whoa. And here I am going for lunch with him and his staff, so his staff could meet me. Like, it was a very weird thing. But that being said, I, I digress. So that being said. He, um, he's the one who told me that I needed to write a book. And I said, but I'm not an autobiography person. I don't want to, I don't feel like I need to write about myself. Like I don't feel that need. And he said, no, 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 it's not about you. It's about your messaging. And it's also about your take home. So when you 
finish after a keynote, people in your audience are only going to remember probably 3% of what you say days later, 3% of what you say will stick to some of them. And he said, but if they want, if they really like your messaging, this will allow them to take it home with them and to be able to look at it again. And also a lot of people in your audience, based on your messaging and what you say, they will be thinking of someone they wish could be there with them right then hearing what you had to say, because they know that that person is either selling themselves short or that person is going through a transition and going through something difficult and just needs a shift of perspective to see the possibilities or whatever. And that is the perfect thing for them to buy that other person. And so he convinced me. And so it, it didn't, it, it's not an autobiography. Now I pull in stories and anecdotes for sure. Um, and there's photos at the back, like colored photos for people to flip through kind of like an album, but just so people can get the inside if they want a little glimpse of, you know, what it was like and what the things that I've done, but it's primarily about messaging and it's, it's kind of like a self-help sort of personal development book, but it's not a how-to book. It's exactly how I speak. It's asking the questions or phrasing, um, stories and laying things out in a way that will make people reflect and look at things in a different way. And then it'll make them start questioning their assumptions about what they currently believe to be possible or impossible and, and kind of shifting a perspective enough so that they might embrace the challenge of seeing how close they can get to a, to a, to a goal or an outcome. And I just believe we're all capable of way more than we give ourselves credit for. And I think it just takes a shift in perspective and the willingness to seize your potential and own your story. And those are like, the, that's the subtitle of my book. So I, yeah. yeah. What, okay. So, and let's end with this. What is the first step somebody can take towards seizing their potential? What's something that you could give people right now that they can walk away with and seize that potential tomorrow? Yeah. So I think the, the, the biggest shift I think comes with a shift in perspective and how you look at goals and how you mm -hmm. look at things. So I'm going to give two things. I'm going to say, first of all, when you're setting your goals, if you've set them before and have failed new year's resolutions. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the question, the biggest question is, you know, Simon Sinek talks about what the why and your why mm -hmm. and stuff, but um, there's a part in my book where I talk about your root. Why it's not just about asking why you're doing it. It's asking that question five times or going down to the point where it's actually a feeling it's it could be something like um you really truly it might not be something you want to admit to other people mm -hmm. but it might be something about validation or security mm -hmm. like why do, why is your goal to get a raise why is your goal to be promoted well because then i get a raise well is it really about that or is it you know why is a raise important to you and why is maybe it's to give your kids more security, like really because you didn't have it. So you feel like you're validated as a parent if you can provide for your kids. Maybe it is um, because you didn't grow up very well. So for you, it's validation or, or proving to someone else that you, it's not about the money, it's just about the title because, and really it's not about the title, it's about proving to those naysayers and those doubters when you were growing up that you can be successful. It's not really about that. It's like, so figuring out what that really is, like. Why do you want to lose weight? Or you want to lose weight just because society is telling you to lose weight? Mm -hmm. Or what's the real what's the real reason? And if that's the case, then that's the case. We just need to own what that is. And that will actually help you when you realize what it is you're doing. Now, to take that next step, I think that the, well, I know based on working with people, that shifting your perspective in terms of how you look at your goals. So once you set and once you figure out your real reason for achieving those, um, I encourage my clients and my people, my followers to set them higher than what they kind of know is sort of possible because magic doesn't happen when there are guarantees there. Magic happens when you push yourself. And if you can set one high enough, it's almost more comforting being like, okay, yeah, I'm setting this goal. It's probably not going to happen, but I'm going to see how close I can get. And it's, that is the only way you will truly, one, you'll surprise yourself when you take that pressure off and you just treat it like a challenge and like a game and, oh, there's an obstacle. Oh, I have an injury or, oh, there's a storm outside. If you treat it in a way that's solution minded and where you're finding solutions and assuming that there's solutions there, then mm -hmm. you start chipping away at it. You start surprising yourself and being like, oh my gosh, I actually am making progress. Like, whoa. <laughs> and then you're like, wow, okay, maybe I'm, and no matter how far you go, you will always get further than if you had set just a guaranteed goal. So <clears throat> my advice is to set the bar really high and just, but set it as a challenge, like embrace it, 
I think that's the whole thing, the mindset shift and embracing it like a challenge to see how close you can get and then you'll figure it out. Mm. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Wow, um, Heather. Thank you. That was yeah. fantastic. I'm I'm gonna maybe I'm so I will sad try, that we're trying out for the voice after You're gonna try all. for the voice. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you should definitely do that. And um and then if you make it on the voice, then Heather and I will come watch in the audience. Yeah. Okay. Yes, we'll do it. You know, I know I just invited Heather to come and hang out with me. So it's fine. Done. Yeah, it's cool. Let the COVID uh, well, ban all slide out. I was assuming, assuming that, you know, yes, assuming that we get past coronavirus and we, yeah. we actually can travel again. Thank you so much for being here. Unfortunately, we really do have to wrap up. Is there you anything else? Is, yeah, I do. Is there anything else that you want to share with the audience really quick before we go? No, I don't think so. I don't want to make okay. you late for your class, Same. but it's oh, been great. great. That's okay. If I'm late, it's an online class. They'll never know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, I'll be okay, I promise. But um, anyway, thank you so much. Um, everyone else, stick around. Jillian and I are going to wrap up the show in just a moment. And Heather, thanks so much for being here. I appreciate it. Awesome. You're welcome. Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs>could have kept Heather on for another hour or so. I could have too. And the thing is for me, like I'll tell you something about this show. Um, uh, I've never followed athletes before. Like I've never really had a lot of respect, right. you know, like not, I wouldn't say respect, um, but I just, it's not something I would ever follow. And now because of you know, Heather and some of the runners we have interviewed before, I I'm starting to really getting into following athletes. As a matter of fact, it's funny because I didn't even mention this to Heather, but I started following Lolo Jones on um, on Instagram recently. Just who's a who's an American bobsledder who has a very similar sort story as Heather's. She was a runner and then she decided to do bobsledding. Like and and. She, also, she's been told she was too old too. So um, I just think it's fantastic, and and the discipline and the and the foresight to go like, okay, I can do, I can do this, I can make so, this happen. So do you think we should start like a last life ever curling team? Because I think we might still be in the, the window for curling. Like, <laughs> oh like wait, I'm we not might supposed still... to say that. Heather basically <laughs> just told us that we're supposed to go way beyond. No, oh, yeah, and I'm no. saying we're only going to be able to well, do curling. Well, yeah, yeah. All right. So did you bring a joke for today? I'm just curious because I actually I, did for a change. I have, yes, I'm going to let you go first okay. because I have a bobsled this is, joke. So That's mine's not, not a good. bobsled joke, but it's kind of an Olympic sport joke. So it's sort of on topic. It's not completely on topic. Okay. Why did the, okay, here's the question. Why couldn't the green pepper practice archery? I, I don't know why. He didn't habanero. Oh my God. <laughs> It's so terrible. Like, it's such a terrible I joke. I wish you didn't tell that one. I kind of do, too, actually. My wife sent that to me while we were on there. I looked at it on my phone just now. She was like, <laughs> you always forget a joke. Here's here's a joke. So we'll blame her. Okay, Bob Sled, but can Bob ski? Hmm. <laughs> See, terrible, terrible. It's, it's even worse than mine, actually. <laughs> you know, with, with that, I think we should probably just, like, call it quits. What do you think? I think that's a good idea. Everybody, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Jillian Sidoti, and this is Jeffrey Holst, and he reminds you to do what? Live the best version of your last life ever. Never gonna